with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Natalia Melman uh, Petrozella, author of Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Exercise Obsession. And later in the show, Daniel Finn, features editor at Jacobin to give us an update on UK politics. Meanwhile, the Fed is yet again raising interest rates, this time by a quarter point to 5%. Progressives continue to sound alarm bells a federal appeals judge has ruled against trump in his quest to hoard classified documents stop the steal the archivist of the documents do not archive work now. i said for trump on it the White House is shutting down its covid response team ahead of the public emergency declaration expiring in may just cause the Senate voted 80, 86 to 9 to keep the 2001 AUMF a war on terror relic that gives the president extreme latitude. The Chicago Teachers Union has endorsed Brandon Johnson in the mayoral race and his poll numbers have soared. The Biden administration is defending its approval of a copper mining project in court. The project would destroy sacred Apache religious sites in the Southwest. And an AP poll has Biden's approval rating near the lowest of his presidency, down seven points from 45% last month. The UN's water conference, first in decades, highlights how two billion people, a quarter of the planet, doesn't have access to clean drinking water. And that's only gonna get worse with climate change. A Wyoming judge has temporarily blocked the state's abortion ban. In Florida, however, DeSantis is proposing expanding Don't Say Gay to every grade, up to 12. Free speech. This comes as Florida's right-wing House of Representatives has proposed an anti-trans bill so extreme and broad it could affect birth control and breast cancer patients. And lastly, Carrie Lake's latest challenge to her election loss has been basically entirely, with one, with the exception of one case, shot down by the Arizona Supreme Court. Whoops! All this and more on today's Majority Report, or a Majority Report, as we call it over here. Hope everyone's doing well. It is Thursday. Hello, Matt. Hello, Bradley. Hello, Emma. Um, Sam is done recording the PBD podcast. Oh, yeah. I saw some early... When did that air? Was it last night or is it this no, morning? It's, it's out on YouTube today. Oh, it's out already? Because yeah, so, I saw some reviews in the uh, chat. Interesting. Yeah, so it's, he, it's already out. Did they do it live? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. do it live. It was yeah, li- it, it started streaming live about uh, I think around nine a.m. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. I'm definitely excited to check that out a little bit later. Uh, you guys should all check that out. Um, this he's like a kind of right wing business type guy, and he's been doing debates with a variety of people. Like David Pakman was on there. Yeah. Um, other online like I, leftist personalities. I know nothing about him, but I can say I, and no offense to anybody else who has these initials, but PBD. It reminds me of peanut butter. I, I don't like that as a combination of letters. It, e, what? Because they all rhyme. They all rhyme. PBD. Like I, it reminds me of Sebede. Like, yeah. Like, I, I, I'm not. 
I'll, I'll, that's why I'm not going to learn anything about the guys, so I can just keep that sort of surface level critique. Is I don't like the sound of his. Uh, I mean, who says that surface level, right? That, to me, it's like that's a meta critique uh, of just like his name construction. Now, um, let's let's turn to this here because I mentioned in the headlines that the Biden administration is closing down its um, COVID response uh, team in the White House ahead of the end of the emergency declaration in may you know i don't understand the rush to end the COVID emergency declaration you could just keep it in perpetuity and have some uh of the advanced capacity that that provides to you at your disposal especially because we don't know what's going to happen in the coming months as the virus mutates but there seems to be this like desperate push to the right on many fronts Try you know to... what state has still has the state of emergency for uh, COVID? Which state? Texas, because uh, he wants to use it for border stuff. Uh, well, <laughs> exact. So that that's the so he's do he's ending Title Forty Two, but then trying to replace it with uh, basically Trump's policy on immigration. Right. That'll definitely appease uh, the right wingers on Fox News. They'll definitely not say that the borders are open. I mean, they will no matter what he does. Same thing with COVID. They'll still call you a COVID authoritarian even if you end this emergency declaration. And the problems that this is going to create, I, Bernie highlights this here in this hearing with the Moderna CEO, Stephanie Bansell. And Moderna, I mean, they're all price gougers, but in the pandemic, Moderna was known to like be incredibly aggressive on this front. They are proposing to quadruple the price of the COVID vaccine so that they can make a profit. And Bernie kind of hammered her here uh, on on that point. It was announced that the federal government put money into Moderna. You became the stock boxes soared. You became a multi-billionaire overnight. So it's hard for me not to believe that the federal government played a major role in the development of this drug. But here is the main point. I don't want to talk about what happened three years ago. We're here today. You're a multi-billionaire. Of the people, top executives on your company are multi-billionaires, all developed as a result of the vaccine. And now we have a situation where you are proposing to quadruple the price of the new of the vaccine once the government stockpile runs out. That will mean that not only and we'll talk about later on the patient assistance program, but in terms of government, in terms of Medicare, Medicaid, other government agencies, taxpayers are going to have to spend substantially more money. My question to you is given the fact that you have made billions of dollars, that your company has made huge profits on behalf of the taxpayers of this country, will you reconsider your decision to quadruple the price of the vaccine? So Chairman Sanders, what we have to do is to deal with the complexity I described, and I'm happy to go into more detail for this hearing. Mm. This is not the same product. We used to have 10 doors in each vial. Now we're going to have every... Value will have a different dose. This is not the same. I understand, but quadrupling the price is huge, and I will hope. I would hope very much that you will reconsider that decision. It's going to cost the taxpayers of this country billions of dollars. That's something you can do. The volume we had during the pandemic gave us economies of scale we won't have anymore. That is what is different. Well, okay, first of all, uh, he's, I guess, French. I thought Stephanie was a woman's name in this instance. My bad. There's there's an accent on the E. I I, I don't know if that would have helped me on the sound sheet, Bradley. But regardless, like, so I have a simple solution for uh, uh, Stephanie Bancel there. Since the United States taxpayers uh, pay for that research, we can just take it off your hands. You don't have to worry about raising the price and just like, give it to the government i mean the the, in any sane society the federal government spending billions of dollars on the research and development of these kinds of life-saving vaccines made possible by the emergency authorization and the government um and and taxpayer money as bernie says in any sane society that would mean that the state would then own that product because in terms of investment the state provided these companies with the necessary funds to develop this life-saving technology. So cool. That inflated your stock price. Everyone got really rich off of that, even if the vaccines were technically free because they were paid for by the government. 
Moderna and Pfizer made windfall after windfall because of the success of the vaccine that was made possible again by taxpayer money. Now, you guys can take your bag and go home. The stock price has gone up. You've all made a bunch of money, I'm sure, on stock buybacks and all of that good stuff. Take your bag and then give it to the state, which they'll never do, because now that they have a successful vaccine product, they're going to try to milk it for all it's worth, which, uh, it is, which, yeah. which they should be they should be waving. Well, they should have been forced to waive the IP uh, by the Biden administration. But that's the limits of liberalism versus kind of leftism. I mean, that's the real problem here is like, uh, you know, Bernie's trying to get this guy to make commitments that the structure of our society doesn't allow him to actually make. Um, like, I, I do want to just dwell on like how uh, um, useless the sort of anti-vax anti-vaxxer left is and 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 basically sort of aiding this robbery which like these guys are getting out of here with this mm -hmm. intellectual property because this stuff is all confused because half of um well i mean maybe not half of the left but a lot of these morons on the anti-vax side of thing have been acting like these things are causing sudden death and that's completely confused the response to this, which is like to call for nationalization and public yes. IP um, for stuff like this. Like, what is the theory here that Moderna just wants to let rich people get access to this sudden death causing? So, and this is satire, YouTube. Yes. Um, sudden death causing <laughs> um, concoction. Like, of course, that's ridiculous. And that's why I, I say like those people have been working for pharma uh, despite saying everybody else is. Yeah. Um so the proposed hike is $130 per vaccine dose uh, without insurance. And that means that what Moderna is attempting to do here, because, well, it really, we can blame Biden here, but this all started because the Trump administration under uh, in 2020 essentially just gave them a blank check and said, yeah, you, you have no assurances to us. Here's the taxpayer giveaway corporate welfare for this company. Um, you know, uh, this is just going to further widen the gap that we have where because we have privatized health care, the poor in this country have such disparate health outcomes to wealthy people who have access to these kinds of things that now, and this already happened during COVID, the gulf is going to continue to widen because people who are uninsured are not going to be able to pay $130 per vaccine dose. Um, and frankly, the government needs to get off its ass and ban this kind of stuff and put some price controls, especially given the context that we just delineated um, about how we paid for it. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to be joined by uh, Natalia Melman Petrozella. Be right back. back and we are joined now by natalia melman petrozella uh, associate professor of history at the new school and author of the book fit nation the gains and pains of america's exercise obsession natalia thanks so much for coming on i'm excited to be here 
Of course. So um, I, I find it fascinating. And, you know, beauty standards changing uh, throughout history is not a new topic. But how rapidly uh, women in particular ch change, it changed from uh, exerting yourself with exercise is discouraged. And it's frankly unattractive and unbecoming. Mm -hmm. And then soon um, it's necessary to be uh considered you know attractive in uh in society and that's driven in part by as you write in your book um like this wave of industry uh in in fitness so how did things change and change so quickly on that front yeah. So for women, there's this really kind of complicated push and pull, which is exactly what you articulate. That on the one hand, you know, when you think about like exercise in women, there's this great triumph that like women who were told like, just sit there in luxurious comfort and God forbid you get muscles or sweat. Like we don't have that anymore. Right. But at the same, by the same token, now we have these pressures that like, you know, to be a lady, you should be going to spin class or doing bar and have a six pack and biceps. And so I kind of show the way that that happened. And I think that it's a mixture of like some really wonderful advances that feminists and kind of women's health advocates have been at the forefront of promoting of saying, you know, women can run long distances and lift heavy things. And it's good for them, us uh, to be physically active. But on the other hand, and this is what's kind of insidious and disturbing. One of the reasons it's actually been sort of easy to sell exercise to women is because so much of the marketing is actually tied up with like, this will make you pretty, this will make you thin. And like it's normal for women to want to work on their appearance. So this isn't really about strength or sports. This is about being hot. And that's something that's actually always been really easy to sell to women in this country. Yeah, so, so I mean, take us back then to like uh, Jack LaLanne, LaLanne yeah. and some of these exercise gurus uh, marketing themselves to housewives and how this really all started. Yeah, Jacqueline's a major figure in here. So some of our younger uh, listeners, viewers probably won't know who he is. So he was kind of like the one of the first really important fitness influencers, definitely through media. He had a TV show called The Jacqueline Show. And to give you a sense, so this guy, Jacqueline, came out of Muscle Beach. He was a bodybuilder. And he was one of these guys who was honestly seen like with a lot of suspicion, like these men who who lifted weights and like worked on their body all day. It was like, there's something wrong with you. Like you're narcissistic, you're weird. So he decides, well, no, I'm going to have this TV show um, where I'm not only going to exercise on TV, but I'm going to invite people to do it with me. No one wanted to fund it. They're like, nobody would ever do this. This is so weird. So he gets the money together and his audience is homemakers, suburban homemakers, mostly white women in the 1950s. And when you watch, it's really interesting because there's something like, you know, sort of very empowering about it. He talks about exercise being a way to feel happier and healthier. And he says like, set aside your ironing, ladies. This is time for you. And there really is that like me time aspect to like working on your body. On the other hand, if you watch like hours and hours of this, as I did, there's this kind of like dark undercurrent, which is basically like, and if you don't feel energetic, young, healthy, and combat those spreading hips, you have no one to blame but yourself. <laughs> you should be exercising every day. And I think that kind of push pull again is like still really with us. You know, there's something great about exercise is me time, but it's also this other freaking thing that you have to do or you're expected to do. I mean, I, I, I feel this personally, right? Like I try to go to the gym three or four times a week. And if I don't do that, I feel genu genuinely bad about myself. Like I do well, not feel good. And uh, I feel a lot of guilt associated with it. Um, I am sorry about that. I think you're not the only <laughs> one who feels that way, men or women, by the way. I, it took me like almost 10 years to work on this book. And every time I'd be like, oh, I'm writing a book about fitness culture, people would be like, I'm so bad. I haven't worked out. And I'm like, I'm not the police, you know? And right. But it, I am charting the history of that expectation. And I think one of the reasons it's hard to kind of, you know, unbraid all of the things going on there is because on the one hand, we do know exercise is really good for you. It's not surprising that you feel better when you exercise three to four times a week, like science, people with degrees, you know, that not are not mine have shown that that really is key to feeling good and living a longer, healthier, happier life, all the rest. On the other hand, like there is that part where it's like, well, why do you feel bad? Because you're not actually getting the physiological benefits or because you're being kind of told all the time, like you're not a good person if you don't exercise. And so that's a lot of what I'm trying to kind of get us to think critically about in this, um, in this book. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I think so much of that uh, comes from the the consumptive element or consumption element with exercise, which means that like what you wrote about, and I, I haven't really thought about the fitness industry as broadly uh, as of course you did in your book and you also worked in it um, as well. The, the, the idea that um, the, the private sector has essentially created this explosion of gyms, fitness classes, uh, equipment, everything kind of in the private space and that is really what is associated with fitness specifically in the united states as opposed to outdoor public spaces where everyone can work out together for free um i mean what was your take on that particularly because i know you've worked uh, at places like lululemon um that are clearly at the center of this Slightly privatized part of that uh, sector. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So like there's this kind of two big picture narratives that I try to trace over more than a century. And one is how exercise went from being something considered sort of like shady and weird and suspicious and narcissistic, you know, for men and women in different ways, it was considered inappropriate to being something that in a culture where we are so divided on basically everything, most people agree exercise is good for you. Like, I don't care who you voted for, like that's kind of a consensus position. On the other hand, what's so sad to me is exactly what you hint at there, which is that despite these moments in our history when that consensus like almost yielded like great public infrastructure for recreation, for physical education, pools, parks, all that kind of stuff, instead it's actually a private industry that has run with that idea that exercise is good for you, it makes you a good person, it's like in, you know, integral to mental health and to um you know, spiritual health into community and all that. And for the most part, that's something that we're sold as a product as opposed to something, as opposed to something that we're guaranteed as kind of a right of humanity or citizenship. And so, you know, part of this book is I kind of look at, I don't want to say the rise and fall, but the rise and kind of, you know, dubious state of the physical ed education profession. Um, and also like what happened to some of these policy initiatives, you know, like in the cold war where the idea was introduced that fitness is part of being a good American. And there were some real problems with the assumptions of like the way that worked, but it was right. considered to be a public priority. We've largely lost that. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I think, uh, maybe drive some of the resentment or pushback like well one when michelle obama was saying there should be healthy eating in schools a lot of that's just like well you're a black woman so uh i th that's uh, there's resentment there right like just right, general right. racism oh, yeah. about anything she does but I, I also because it's not introduced to the public as a public good uh right. providing for the fitness and uh nutrition of human beings it, it, it it's such a privatized space at this point that I think there's natural gatekeeping and frustration from average people. I mean, you talk about how only 20% of Americans actually fall under the category of exercising regularly and are able to use these systems. And, and that's because we have a like a, a sickness in this country called capitalism that p keeps people out of these spaces. But like that alienating element, I think there's a connection there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the reasons that... Um, the whole exercise ethos is so appealing in our country is because it's so individualistic, right? There's this appealing mythology, everything about the myth of the self-made man and self-fashioning. What more appealing place to think that's really possible than the gym? All you need is to get outside and have some motivation and willpower. And if you don't do that, it's on you. And that is so dominant in our kind of fitness culture. So I try to say, actually, that's a really unfair assumption. And that's so disempowering and doesn't even account for why 80% of people are not, you know, getting the recommended daily minimum of exercise. And well, the books about, about fitness, you know, it's connected to all these other um, aspects of inequality in our country. Like if you live in a neighborhood without tree cover, it's that much hotter to go outside and run however many days a year. If you live in a body where you're considered suspicious or vulnerable when you go out for a jog, I don't care if you have all the willpower in the world, you're going to be less likely to do that safely. Um, very similarly, if you even think about housing and, you know, how long it takes you to get to work, or if you work unpredictable shift labor, like how hard is it to be able to work this into your life? And so, you know, that's something that I really try to like, 
you know, stay on topic with fitness, would say this is connected to so many as other aspects of inequality and like more individual willpower and gumption, though, yes, you do need that, whoever you are to get off the couch and work out. And we probably all, you know, sometimes need that reminder. That is not the solution here or the problem. Right. Yes. And, and, and uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's become a symbol of affluence, right? Yeah. In the way that other say, you know, say diamonds were in the housewife era or the right kind of dress, like, um, uh, or in the pre Jack Lane uh, era before it became more mainstream. Yeah. Like the, the, it's amazing how quickly it turned from a, uh, an empowering branding to something that causes like general uh, alienation or like a uh, another sense of anxiety about not being enough. Absolutely. And I mean, you see it like starting really in like the late 1950s with some of the early kind of chain gyms. I talk about these tanny health spas. There's so much effort and they're smart to realize this, that these entrepreneurs put into like selling the idea that exercise is not this like gross, weird thing that happens in basements with like big dudes pumping iron. This is about an affluent lifestyle. And they're like tropical fish tanks in the gyms. And like they say, they all say they have like thick carpeting, which I think is disgusting, but that's supposed to be this kind of sign of luxury that goes with exercise. But, you know, you see versions of that well into today. And to me, like big picture, it really speaks to how we think about exercise in this country as like somewhere between labor and leisure. I think as opposed to like the diamonds or the fancy car or the expensive cocktails, like people are actually more comfortable in some ways spending a lot of money on exercise because like, well, that's work. And that shows that you are, you know, investing in yourself and in health. And those are virtuous things. Whereas the kind of overt conspicuous consumption of more flashy things, you know, there are people who are into that, but there are more people who are uncomfortable with it. One moment just recently, I think that might interest like your particular audience is like, one thing that I realized is like, you know, we had the financial crash in 2008, 2009, obviously so many people losing their homes, foreclosures, all the rest. It's also the rise of boutique fitness in that moment, which is mm. like the highest price point at that time. And one of the ways that I argue that I think that that actually makes sense is that it's also the moment when social media really comes out and people are pressured to perform their lives all day, their consumption habits. It's no longer really tasteful to show off a lot of money and spending and fancy life if you have it, but to show off, oh, I spent you know $30 on this exercise class because I care about health or $100 on these yoga pants, that sort of is a little bit more culturally acceptable because we so sanctify the pursuit of health and fitness. Yeah, the 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 sanctifying part is is fascinating to me. Um, but it's just like, can you expand on that point about it uh, becoming a, a consumptive uh, performative element? Because it, it fitness being consumption, I don't necessarily think is a concept that might come naturally to people when they think about it. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think there's this really big turning point in the 1950s in the Cold War where, you know, exercise had been suspicious and weird for all the reasons that we said. And then there's this sense that, well, actually, like the good life that Americans are living and that we say to the, you know, the Soviet Union, like we've got all these great things. We've got suburbs and cars and TV sets and frozen food and all these things. There's some people who look at the results of that on American bodies and they're like, actually, this thing that you trumpet as an example of American strength is actually making us weak. And like Eisenhower and JFK jump right on this. JFK is like, um, you know, condemning the soft American and the pages of Sports Illustrated. And they start to have this kind of um, promotional program to have fitness programs, recreation, physical education in schools. Like to be a good American is to be fit that kind of falters. Like it's never really very well funded. The kind of pressures of the Cold War change. All these people who are actually like, what are you doing? We shouldn't be preparing like, you know, these fit people. We should be spending on science and technology. That side of like the Cold War pressure kind of wins out. Hmm. But what you have is this whole generation of entrepreneurs who are like, yeah, it makes you a good American. And it also shows that you have money to spend. And it's also almost a little bit of like, you know, a kind of 
of Protestant work ethic. Like you can show off that you're working hard, yes. come spend money and do that and come join these communities, gyms, health clubs, et cetera, to find like-minded people who want to work on their bodies in the same way. And so that's kind of like the general idea. And then it takes different shapes. Like you see, you know, um, this idea that like working on your body is part of like a fully actualized self and that it's up to you, the individual, to take your health in your hands. That is so appealing across the political spectrum. And, you know, I write about like feminists who are like, yeah, like take the power back from these doctors in white coats, Black Panthers saying versions of the same thing. And then you've got these like hardcore libertarians and people at Oral Roberts University who are like, yeah, like, you know, you know, it's up to you, personal responsibility. Don't wait for some government like healthcare handout, get out there and run on the open road. And you really see that ideology with, with exercise at its center being something embraced across um, you know, the political landscape, landscape and thus marketed really, really effectively, especially as we get into an era of austerity politics, when a lot of funding for all kinds of public programming mm. and otherwise fall away. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really something. And it's really depressing. Like I read all these PE journals, physical education journals, and like in the late 70s, early 80s, they're like, our time has come, you know, for our profession, like, this is going to be the boom moment for phys ed. And it never really happened in part because a lot of those programs were defunded and people who would have gone into PE, I heard again and again in my interviews were like, actually, I can make all this money making VHS and, you know, connecting with all these communities in other ways. Can you imagine I would have been a phys ed teacher? And to mm. me, that's so sad because that's where most Americans will first encounter exercise. And it's seen as this kind of, you know, depressing path. And I think that's unfortunate. And, you know, well, we, we, we don't help. pay our teachers yeah. enough, right? Like that's, it's a part of We've commodified this space so entirely, as you lay yeah. out so well in your book, that it it's it, it keeps uh, people who might be talented in that sphere from entering into the public sector, because what is the public sector yeah. Um, yeah. for exercise? And something that you said really reminded me of like when you talked about how there's the Protestant work ethic uh, being displayed physically, if you're physically yeah. fit. It's that. It's also the fact that you're as you also I'm kind of reiterating you're wealthy enough to have the time to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. You're also wealthy enough to probably go to a, a boutique fitness club like Equinox or Lifetime. Um, or the third thing here, too, is I've read about this in connection to like analyzing the Kardashians and their social um, what what they kind of epitomize about our culture is that um, there's this new era of like beauty and fitness where displaying the work and money that goes into your body is a big part of the beauty standard, which is why when people say, oh, they look fake, that's kind of the point because it's showing I have the money and the funds to make my face contoured in a way through surgery, through injections, whatever, that can also display my wealth. It's almost alien or otherworldly. And that is, I think, another extension of, of the performance of like p making you know, capitalism be a part of your, your body. Yeah, it's so you're so right. And it's so interesting, like, obviously, like professional, like, image people for a long time have kind of exercised, but like well into the, I would say the early 2000s, it was kind of like a behind the scenes thing that you did. Like, you know, Jane Fonda didn't want to record her first VHS tape in part because she's like, I'm a movie star and it's very vulnerable to be like working out on a VHS tape. Like, what is that? You know, I'm paraphrasing her, but um, now we don't have that. It's part of the appeal to kind of show the work. And I think you're right that it like does cohere with all of, you know, Ozempic or the injections or all of the different kinds of um, chemical interventions that people make and, and surgical ones. But I do think I haven't quite figured out the way this is going to play out now or in the future, but there's always been a real tension between like people who get their appearance, like through exercise exercise, which we tend to think is like legitimate because you're like, you know, you've got the willpower to do it versus this quote unquote easy way out of, you know, wearing a corset um, or fashion. A lot of health, uh, a lot of fitness um, proponents would say like, you know, you don't know what really lies underneath like that, those dresses mm. or those corsets or whatnot. And so I think there's a little bit of that discourse around the surgery, although you're right, like it does take work and money and pain um, to do any of it. If it's not the pain that we conventionally associate with exercise. Yeah, and and it is in terms of like the gyms in and of themselves, it also shows how like 
choosing between say going to equinox or planet fitness or blank which we have here in new york mm -hmm. i mean th that also is a moment of class stratification and class anxiety in and of itself right Oh, absolutely. I mean, all of those places signify very different um, income levels. I do think it's really notable, though, that how expansive this sector is. And the fact that even, you know, with the pandemic, like when people thought brick and mortar was dead, it is not dead. It's basically back. And we have expansion at the kind of very low end, that's Planet Fitness and Blink, and also at the very high end. Like the high end to me, I can't believe it. The price points get keep getting higher and higher and higher. Like there seems to be no ceiling yeah. as to um, what people are willing to, to do in terms of luxury and, and uh, you know, equating luxury with fitness. Yeah. Um, lastly, I mean, I I am curious about uh, what you think about the personalization of some of the fitness equipment that's being used, where um, it's now moved from you can become a part of this club and that can be your class signifier if you're an Equinox member to now you need to also have it in your home and you can be it's, this isn't about community anymore. This is about like. I mean, I know that that was pandemic focused as well, but these are products that are further atomizing and making them extremely private outside of the, the public sphere. Yeah, it's really hard to like, say it represents one thing, the kind of home fitness trend. I think like on the one hand, yeah, there is the kind of like, it's like the hyper atomization. There's not even the kind of like unexpected conversation in the locker room or with the front desk person or, you know, the maybe not getting the spot that you want, like you kind of take away that third place socializing and you just have like, I want my playlist and my person at my time. It's like the uberification of exercise. And I think that, yeah, that signifies all the troubling social atomization that we're talking about. On the other hand, at home exercise has also always been a real engine of inclusivity for people who don't feel comfortable going to gyms, for people with childcare uh, challenges, for people... Um, um, you know, with a range of disabilities. Like, so I, I hesitate to say it just represents one thing. But one thing I do think is interesting is that for much of American history, at home exercise devices were always at, like sold as this is cheap and like no one will know you have it. You can hide it away. Now it's like, the Peloton is like a freaking piece of furniture that people like show off, you know? And, uh, and I think that that's interesting in terms of it not being something like you wouldn't want people to know you do, but rather something that people still kind of peacock about, even if it's at home. Well, uh, really fascinating read. Um, uh, Natalia Melman Pezzarella, uh, associate professor of history at the new school, author of the book of the book called uh, fit nation, the gains and pains of America's exercise obsession. We'll put a link to the book in the description uh, everywhere you're listening to or watching this and at majority.fm. Uh, thanks so much, Natalia. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right, guys, quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by Daniel Finn.
are back, and we are joined now by Daniel Finn, a features editor at Jacobin, author of One Man's Terrorist, A Political History of the IRA. Uh, Daniel, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Of course. So uh, you wrote a, a long piece in Jacobin that I w- will link to, and I encourage everybody to read, um, about what The Economist has deemed, quote, the great moderation in the UK right now. Um, and that refers to kind of the expulsion of uh, Jeremy Corbyn and then subsequently Nicholas uh, Sturgeon uh, of the S uh, or SNP. Um, explain that for our audience, especially if they're not from the UK, what that means and uh, what the, the term great moderation is supposed to kind of uh, engender. Yeah, the article was inspired by that piece from The Economist and some other commentary along similar lines in the British media, which seized upon the fact it was a coincidence, but on the same day last month in February, Nicola Sturgeon resigned as the leader of the SNP and Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, announced that he would block Jeremy Corbyn, who was his predecessor, from running as a Labour candidate in the next general election. And this was seized upon by The Economist and by others to announce that the age of populism and political turbulence in Britain over the last decade was coming to an end. We're now going back to sensible politics, managerial competence rather than populist sloganeering and so on. And they clearly welcomed what they saw as this development. Now, the big problem with that, without even getting on to the way in which it misrepresents both Jeremy Corbyn and Nicola Sturgeon and the respective political movements associated with them. The big problem with this idea of the great moderation is the Conservative Party, which is still in government. It's doing very badly in the polls at the moment, but still has its hands on the levers of political power. And just in the last couple of weeks, the Conservative Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has brought forward yet another piece of legislation targeting immigrants and refugees, trying to make it impossible for people who have entered the country illegally to claim asylum. And at the same time, they're making it virtually impossible for people to enter the country legally so that it's a catch-22 situation. And at the same time, she went on a widely publicized trip to Rwanda to showcase the center that is being set up there for refugees who come to Britain. She wants them to be sent there instead. It's the Mm -hmm. nearest thing they can get to the Australian system of taking people and marooning them on Pacific islands. There's a real fixation on the British right with what they call Australian style immigration system. And this is the nearest thing that she can get to it to send people off to Rwanda to the tender care of Paul Kagame. So the, the sense that British politics was entering a great moderation totally ignores and overlooks that. And what it really means is that there is no longer a challenge to the British political and economic status quo from the left. And that's what The Economist and others are celebrating. Yeah, I mean, it's disturbing to see that because if it's a moderation would mean would mean, as you say, that, oh, the right is becoming a little bit less extreme, so we don't need to uh, have as much of a watchful eye on it, or at least that's the implication of like that that moniker and that piece. But the reality, as you say, is that both in the UK and throughout the world, the right is only becoming more emboldened, particularly when it comes to trans issues, LGBTQ uh, uh, abuses and discrimination and uh, 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 across uh, nations when it comes to refugees and immigrants. I mean, we're seeing that in Italy um, with Maloney and, as you say, in the UK as well. So it. It's it's almost like uh, it's not wish fulfillment, but it's m- misrepresenting the problem in service of like justifying the expulsion of more progressive members from uh, from labor and that coalition. Yes, absolutely. It's no exaggeration to say, I think, that people such as The Economist and, and people representing that position in the commentariat would like the political spectrum to go in terms of France today, for example, from Emmanuel Macron to Marine Le Pen. So an increasingly 
authoritarian right-leaning center, uh, which is carrying out all kinds of discriminatory policies against ethnic minorities or religious minorities, and at the same time trying to strip people of their rights, uh, as Macron is doing at the moment. And then an ultra-nationalist, demagogic, populist, far-right, as the only challenger to that, and as a kind of bogeyman that you can wave in people's faces and say, well, you have to vote for Macron or whatever the local equivalent of a politician such as Macron might be, because you have to keep out the far right. He, he is the lesser evil. And what they want to exclude is any kind of, however moderate, left-wing alternative to the status quo. Now, in terms of Britain, the status quo means, in practical terms, wage stagnation reaching on from all, almost 20 years um, since the crisis of 2008 there has been no wage growth for british workers and it's predicted that this will continue well into the latter part of this decade so people in in, in real terms will not have received a rise since 2007 2008 and when people talk about the political turbulence of the last decade as if it was some kind of eruption of madness something totally inexplicable and unforeseeable that kind of material foundation for political turbulence is something that they they entirely ignore because it is a product of the british economic model it's not a dysfunction of that model it's a feature not a bug and um, the, the thatcher economic model that was put in place in the 1980s which was turbocharged then after the great financial crisis with a decade of austerity that is the way it's meant to work. It's meant to keep uh, the working class on their knees. It's meant to keep organised labour shut out of any capacity to represent people's rights. And it's inevitable that you will get turbulence in that kind of situation. And there was a challenge to that over the last decade, which took two different forms, but they had certain features in common. There was the Scottish independence movement in the middle part of the decade, and then there was the mobilisation in the Labour Party around Jeremy Corbyn. The Scottish independence campaign, when they had a referendum on independence in 2014, did take the form of an anti-austerity social movement. It mobilised a very large section of people. There was a very high turnout, comparatively speaking, in working class council estates where normally people wouldn't be engaged with conventional politics or conventional elections, there was a turnout of about 85% in that referendum, which is much higher than you'd get in general elections. And people were clearly voting against the British status quo. They were voting against the model of Thatcher and indeed the model of Tony Blair. There was an opposition to war in the Middle East, as well as opposition to austerity and privatisation on the home front. And that was really what lifted the Scottish National Party up to its position of hegemony in Scottish politics. The following year, you had the breakthrough in the Labour Party by Jeremy Corbyn and his supporters, which took everyone by surprise, including the Labour left themselves. And they subsequently went on to perform very well in the 2017 general election, not enough to overtake the Tories, but enough to deprive them of their majority. So they were both drawing on similar energies, um, albeit the fact that Sturgeon and Corbyn were very different politicians. Sturgeon, in terms of her personal politics and instincts, was much more of a liberal centrist figure. She had much more in common with someone like Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand mm. than with Bernie Sanders or Jean-Luc Mélenchon, whereas Corbyn was very much in that mould of left-wing, anti-austerity, anti-establishment politics that we saw over the last decade. Well, and and I want to uh, return to Sturgeon in a second, but I just wanted to flesh out what really, you know, happened in the wake of Corbyn's loss and what Labour actually took from that. I mean, do you think that they saw that as an opportunity to then ramp up this campaign of anti smears of anti-Semitism um, because the the loss was an opportunity to say, hey, we, we tried it. We tried it, young, like, liberal base that was in favor of Corbyn. We tried putting him out uh, to represent the party, and now it's time to uh, to crack the whip, so to speak, and get the party back in line. Like, how do you... I mean, there's the, the, the Panorama report that you write about. Um, for people that may not be familiar, can you speak about what 
that looked like in the wake of his loss um, and how labor responded with these kinds of materials to justify kicking him out? Yes, to begin with, the thing you have to recognize about the internal politics of the British Labour Party is that there is a profound ideological divide there. It's not just a question of tactics or pragmatism. People think one strategy will work better than the other. People have diametrically opposed goals. The gap is as wide as in the Democratic Party in the US between someone like Joe Manchin uh, on the one hand and Rashida Tlaib or Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders on the other. And the right wing tendency of the Labour Party, which was dominant before Corbyn became leader in 2015, which still controlled much of the party apparatus and the parliamentary group in Westminster, was adamantly opposed to Corbyn on grounds of principle to the extent that they would prefer a conservative government to one led by Corbyn or any other politician for the left. It wasn't just a personal animosity towards Corbyn. It was about the, the policies and the principles that he represented. And they put that vision into, into practice, especially after the 2017 general election, because you found before that the argument against Corbyn is normally pitched in terms of pragmatism. People would say he's a good man, but he's not a leader. And that seemed to be the case, judging by Labour's polling figures, but they surprised everyone. They gained 10 percent of the vote, which was the biggest step forward by any of the major parties in Britain since the Second World War. And afterwards, turning on a dime, the argument became, well, he may be a leader, but he's not a good man. <sighs> Instead of saying he can't become prime minister, they said, well, perhaps he can become prime minister, but he shouldn't be allowed to become prime minister. And none of this is concealed, by the way. It's not a question of inferring it from people's behaviour. It's all on the record. There was a book published by two journalists from the Sunday Times, uh, a conservative newspaper called Gabriel Pogrand and Patrick Maguire, in which they quote a chapter and verse from leading figures on the Labour right, including the deputy leader under Corbyn, Tom Watson, explaining that all through that period, 2017, 2018, 2019, they were doing everything in their power to undermine his leadership and to make it impossible for Labour to win a general election and indeed to function at all as a political party. Now, this is where the allegations of anti-Semitism come into play. It's something that, again, people should be able to understand, I think, from the American context by looking the, at the attacks that are made on politicians like Rashida Tlaib, like Ilan Omar, when they're accused of being anti-Semitic. It's not simply an empirical question where certain allegations are made and you can see whether those allegations are true or false. It's also a conceptual argument about what qualifies as anti-Semitism in the first place. There is a very widespread argument that the dominant form of contemporary anti-Semitism expresses itself through attitudes to Israel. And you can only really respond to that argument when you see specific examples people give of speech about Israel that they consider to be anti-Semitic. So in the context of the British Labour Party, for example, when Labour members waved Palestinian flags at the party conference, that was said to be anti-Semitic. When Labour MPs described Israeli rule over the Palestinians as a form of apartheid that was said to be anti-Semitic. Support for the BDS campaign was said to be anti-Semitic. Again and again and again, allegations of anti-Semitism against Corbyn or against his supporters turned out on closer inspection to concern what they had said about Israel and their positions towards Israel. Now, this was embellished by, as you referred to there, the Panorama documentary to put this in context, Panorama is a long-running documentary slot on the BBC, which is by far the most trusted source of news and current affairs in Britain. If you look at the opinion polls that are taken, people trust the BBC far more than any print newspapers or any other broadcaster. And this documentary slot was given over to a, a very partisan ideological journalist called John Ware, who made no bones about his hostility to Corbyn. And he produced a documentary where he claimed that Corbyn and his allies in the leadership were systematically thwarting efforts to expel people or discipline people with anti-Semitic views from the Labour Party. This was broadcast in the summer of 2019, just months ahead of a general election. It was political dynamite. It dominated the news cycle for weeks at a time. And it is still being referred to as, as damning proof of what a pernicious figure Corbyn was. Now, this documentary 
the claims that it made, the narrative that it put forward, was categorically untrue. And we know this because, among other things, Keir Starmer, after taking over from Corbyn, commissioned a lawyer called Martin Ford to produce a report on the Labour Party's internal culture under Corbyn. Ford produced his report finally last summer, and Starmer accepted that report in public without any criticisms or reservations, although he clearly had no intention of acting upon it. And Martin Ford said specifically that the version of events put forward in this documentary and in other media reports at that time was wholly misleading. That was the phrase that he used. He didn't say it was mistaken or inaccurate in this or that detail. He said the whole narrative was wholly misleading. In fact, it was the exact opposite of the truth. What had happened was that his principal, uh, John Ware, the documentary maker, his principal eyewitnesses in this documentary, they had been working for the Labour Party's disciplinary unit and they had specifically asked the leader's office to get involved and to offer their advice on particular cases. They refused to act until they had this advice. Martin Ford looked at the email exchanges and said this advice was offered in good faith, it was reasonable, it was welcomed by these officials and they subsequently claimed on national television that they had been put under intense pressure to let people with anti-Semitic views off the hook, which was demonstrably untrue. And it really was part of an exercise in, in factional warfare. Uh, the very same officials we know from their WhatsApp conversations and email exchanges and so on, which is all in, in the public domain, they were desperately hoping for a Conservative Party landslide in the 2017 general election. And on the night of the election, when Labour had made unprecedented gains, they described their own reaction to that as being depressed, in, in, in a mood of utter despondency and gloom. A week later, they were still describing themselves as going through a kind of post-traumatic stress, just thinking about the fact that their party had gained 10% of the vote instead of being heavily defeated. And it may seem extraordinary that they would go on national television and make claims that were demonstrably untrue about such a serious matter. But looking at Martin Ford's report and looking at the other evidence, there's, there's no other conclusion that we can draw. Um, so this kind of allegation, this kind of narrative is what was put forward to say that Corbyn was not only unsuitable to be leader on grounds of competence or grounds of personal ability, but he was also morally unsuitable to be the party leader, um, let alone British Prime Minister. And it was demonstrably untrue. Yeah. And I mean, as you say, there's a lot of connections you can draw to the US, but the like the purging of the Democratic Party of pro-Palestinian voices, it's 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 helpful to uh, as a shortcut to expelling progressives more broadly. Like, do you see that as similar in the UK context that being anti-apartheid, uh, anti-Israeli apartheid is kind of a, a harbinger harbinger um, for broader progressive values in in the uk and that's basically why uh starmer and others are hooking on to this as a way to kind of reshape the the labor party in the way that is more pro-corporate uh and more back in line with what it was say a decade ago yes yeah, so i would definitely see it in those terms especially when it comes to foreign policy israel and palestine can be seen as a proxy for a much wider set of issues because people who support Palestinian rights and condemn what Israel is doing to the Palestinians and, and most importantly of all, back up that position with calls for practical action. People who take that position also tend to have critical heterodox views on the whole range of British foreign policy and US foreign policy. And I would say that to a large extent, the attacks on Corbyn over his views on Palestine was a proxy for his views on Iraq, because the whole Labour Party establishment in the early part of this century was implicated in the Iraq war and the occupation and all the catastrophic results that followed, not just people who served at cabinet level under Blair, but also people who were backbench MPs at the time and who voted in favour of invading Iraq. And 
they must at all costs exclude the idea that the invasion of Iraq was a fundamentally criminal enterprise. They can say in hindsight that it was mistaken, that mistakes were made and so on, although the nature of those mistakes is usually defined in extremely vague terms. But if someone says that the invasion and occupation of Iraq was a criminal enterprise from start to finish, from top to bottom, that implicates so much of the Labour Party apparatus and establishment that it has to be locked out at all costs. And Corbyn was unacceptable because he had always opposed the Iraq war, not on grounds of pragmatism, not because it wasn't supported by this or that country at the UN, but because he identified the core of what it was about. It was an exercise in, in crude imperialism um, and, and a bid for domination in the Middle East. And so the convenience of branding critical views towards Israel as being anti-Semitic is, as you say, that it can be used as a brush to tar all kinds of other views. And you saw this and, and still do see it being used in a much wider sense where people will not only refer, I'm, I'm talking about mainstream commentators here, people who write for liberal newspapers in Britain, they'll not only refer to critical views of Israel as being anti-Semitic, they also refer to critical views of capitalism as being anti-Semitic. Uh, it's an extraordinary mm. They're relying on the anti mental gymnastics where... It, yeah. Well, it's it's also just this. Uh, they're yeah. relying on the lowest common denominator as and and extrapolating it more broadly. Like we all know the phrase that anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools, but that's not socialism. <laughs> it's, it's just the socialism of fools. We but it's it's a way to protect, obviously, as you say, capitalism. Yeah, it's it's precisely that kind of argument where because as, as we know, anti-Semites too spread all kinds of pernicious conspiracy theories about Jews controlling the financial system and controlling the banks and so on. Therefore, anyone who talks critically about the banks and about financial elites must be expressing coded anti-Semitism when in the majority of cases they're simply talking about the banks. Yeah. They're talking about the disproportionate power of financial elites and there's no trace of anti-Semitism. Of course, you can't talk about anything that's happened in the last 15 or 20 years without talking critically about the banks and the power of the financial system uh, and the people who control it. And by denying people the ability to talk about that critically and rationally and realistically, you're actually driving them towards these kind of conspiracy theories instead. Agreed. Um, two more questions and then I'll let you go. I mean, where is uh, where is uh, Sturgeon in all of this as well? I mean, how did they... Uh, d did they apply some of the same tactics to her or or no, um, as who you, you spoke about earlier, uh, leader of the Scottish National Party, more uh, center left and not uh, to the uh, Corbyn's kind of extent. But um, how did that go down? So Sturgeon took over the party leadership just after the referendum in 2014. It was a smooth succession after Alex Salmond, the previous party leader, stepped down, there was no leadership contest. And she led them into the 2015 general election where the SNP swept the board in Scotland. They took 50% of the vote. They won almost every Westminster constituency. And at that time, there was a lot of hostility to Sturgeon in the English media, not so much in the Scottish media because Rupert Murdoch's newspaper, The Sun, has an English edition and a Scottish edition and their Scottish edition actually called for an SNP vote when their English edition was presenting huh. Sturgeon as this kind of sinister extremist who was going to break up the UK. Uh, one of the attack lines used against Ed Miliband, who was the Labour leader at that time, was that he would rely on the SNP at Westminster for, for support. The Tories had an election poster that depicted Miliband as being in the pocket, literally in the pocket of Alex Salmond. So there was a lot of that at the time, but then... From the summer of 2015, Corbyn took over as the bogeyman figure in the eyes of the British media because he had the potential to become Britain's prime minister in the way that Nicola Sturgeon obviously did not. Um, her party could only win support in Scotland, whereas the Labour Party had the potential to win support across the whole of Britain. And it was only after the 2019 general election when Corbyn stepped down, was replaced by Starmer, 
Starmer carried out uh, a very effective to date purge of the left from any position of influence and the policies associated with Corbyn from the Labour Party. So in a sense, Sturgeon and the SNP were the last significant threat left standing in mainstream politics. They were still pressing for a second referendum on Scottish independence because they were in a difficult position, although they won again the vast majority of Westminster seats in 2019, although they won the Scottish Parliament election again in 2021 for the third election in a row in 2021. Uh, there was a majority in the Scottish Parliament of parties in favour of independence. And yet there was no obvious channel or mechanism to call a second referendum on independence. There was nothing in the British constitution or the law for devolution of power to Scotland that said they had to call a second referendum. The first referendum back in 2014, that was the result of an agreement between Alex Salmond, who was then the SNP leader, and David Cameron, who was the Tory Prime Minister, both Salmond and Cameron, for their own separate reasons, thought that it was to their advantage to call that referendum. Now Sturgeon found herself effectively banging her head against a brick wall where she called for a second referendum and there were polls all through 2020 and 2021 frequently showing majorities of Scots in favour of independence. And yet Boris Johnson's government simply said, no, uh, we're not going to call a referendum as far as we're concerned, this issue is off the table for a generation. And Sturgeon had no legal uh, or mainstream constitutional mechanism to change that. She had ruled out going down the road of the Catalan independence movement where they were denied permission to hold a legal referendum by Madrid. So they went ahead and held an unauthorised referendum. She ruled that out. So she was effectively in, in a very difficult position and in the final year of her leadership, she did get a small taste of the tactics that were used against Corbyn, except instead of being accused of anti-Semitism, the wedge issue that they chose for this was trans rights. In the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, the SNP had promised to reform the law on gender recognition. So did the Greens, so did Labour and the Lib Dems. Between them, those four parties won three quarters of all the seats at Holyrood. So there was a clear public mandate for the reform that transcended divisions over unionism versus nationalism in Scottish politics. In fact, the Tory party, when Theresa May was prime minister, had been bringing forward proposals for uh, uh, reform of the legislation on, on gender recognition as well. Uh, Boris Johnson subsequently scrapped that because he saw this evidently as an opportunity to engage in a culture war issue, targeting a minority and distracting people from the abject failure of his government and, and his party when it comes to economic issues and people's living standards. So this was the, the point of attack that was chosen over the last year by the Tory government against the SNP when they brought through with the decisive majority in the Scottish Parliament this new law on gender recognition. Uh, the government of Rishi Sunak in London intervened to veto this. This was the very first time since the Scottish Parliament was set up in the late 90s that they used uh, the clause in the Act which gave them the power of veto. And for, for a brief moment, I think Nicola Sturgeon was getting a taste of the treatment that had been meted out to left-wing politicians like Corbyn, where she was being attacked by people who had themselves a track record of misogyny, both in their personal and political lives, and accused of betraying women and betraying women's rights. Um, and I think this was something that must have factored into her decision to step down when she did. There was reason enough for her to step down and the fact that she had simply been in that position for a long time. She had been the party leader for the best part of nine years. She had been in frontline politics ever since she was elected to the Scottish Parliament back in 1999. So on a personal level, you could understand why people would want to take a break. And you could also understand why she would feel that her strategy for independence had run into this deadlock and she would want to pass on the baton to someone else to, to see if they could take things for, forward. But I think it was also very significant that she was being targeted in this way 
And it was almost like a shot across the bows from the British establishment, as if they were saying to her, you've seen what we've done to other people and this is what we could do to you mm. if we put our mind to it. So uh, I don't find it surprising in that sense that she decided to bow out before getting the full taste of, of the treatment that has been meted out to politicians like Corbyn. Well, um, this was very informative and helpful. I wish we had more time. Daniel Finn, features editor at Jacobin, author of One Man's Terrorist, a political history um, of the IRA. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me. Of course. All right, guys, we are going to head into the fun half. Uh, the number is 646-257-3920. RIMs are broken. Like, I don't know what's going on, but they froze basically at the start of the show, uh, and then they aren't coming back. But And I tried to refresh, then I lost all of them. But I did see uh, an IM that I just wanted to respond to really quickly because I didn't want, like, th they actually are broken. But um, I, <laughs> I felt like people might be like, you're dodging this. I'm not. So, um I, I saw that my, my dear friend Anna Kasparian kind of went viral with a tweet. And some people wanted me to weigh in on it. Um, and I just, like, look, she, as I said, dear friend of mine, really good person. I don't think she's anti-trans. I don't think that's really even a question. She has a long track record in this space. And I think her track record should speak for itself. She's been in this space for a long period of time and has done a ton of great work. However, like, I, I really do disagree with the emphasis. Um, like, I think it's wrong to over inflate the usage of kind of lang awkward language like birthing person, both in frequency and in terms of the stakes involved when someone is uh, referred to by that language, because it's awkward. I get it. It's stilted when being used in non-medical or technical terms. But I think that's like kind of the extent of the critique, right? It's awkward. It, it doesn't take away anyone's rights and it's not in when being used right now in that context, it's not taking away anyone's rights. Um, and like as a cis woman myself, I just think it's more important to put into context that like while you might not enjoy the technical language, that awkwardness is inevitable in this current climate and necessary because we're trying to like fortify walls right now as trans erasure is widespread right now. Like there's a barrage of deliberately trans exclusionary language, which is what some of the awkward stilted terminology is meaning to beat back. And that trans exclusionary language is really just the tip of the iceberg for systemic erasure so being diligent about combating that i mean that's at the forefront of my mind so like again i've tried to say this before from my point of view so much of what we do in this business very small business um and i will reiterate that like anna in my opinion is one of the very few good ones um but we have a d disagreement here like um it's it just so much of what we do isn't just how we cover something, it's what we cover, it's story selection, it's what we emphasize, and anyone in private has the right to have preferences about how they want to be identified. But in my position, member of the media, member of the left, the progressive left being kind of spokespeople for the progressive left in an online media space, I just think we have a greater responsibility. and. The assertion that someone wants to just be called a woman in like an individualized, atomized context is completely fair. But within the context of larger anti-trans panic and hundreds of bills on in this on the state level targeting trans people, like I, I just I try to bring a certain amount of awareness about how my statements are going to be taken, and I think it's obtuse to uh, to skirt around the con context, right? Um, so that that's my take on that. But I just wanted to address that because I, even though the IMs are broken, I did see the IM and I didn't want, you know, people to be upset to think I was dodging anything. Yeah, it would have uh, 
people would have uh, immediately said that. I mean, yeah, just like some of the context, Human Rights Campaign warns that yesterday that 50% of transgender youth in America could lose access to gender affirming primary care thanks to new laws from state legislatures across the country. And the truth is that non-binary and trans people get pregnant. And like, how do you um, uh, address that in language? Like, that's actually a, a language problem. Yeah. Um, and like, to me, like, I think like, okay, like clinical language might be uh, like sort of awkward, but it's also awkward to be a trans and non-binary person in this sort of context and try to go through a pregnancy and uh, that sort of care. So I think like it's, it's, the answer to this sort of thing, which is is not much different than when Jordan Peterson was talking about it, which is like actually we're we're these sort of guidances. Like when the CDC, the CDC still references people as women, mm -hmm. but it also includes this other language too for these you know rarer cases. Um, and I, I think like that's just all this is. I, I don't think there's anything deeper to it. All right, we want to bring in uh, Binder and Brandon, um, but on ESPN. Uh, check us out, youtube.com slash ESPN show. We gave a full breakdown of week one in uh, free agency. We spoke about March Madness, the upsets, Aaron Rodgers drama unpacked, and more, youtube.com slash ESPN show. Uh, and Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, yeah, Left Reckoning, we had uh, Danny Bessner on to talk about uh, Iraq, and uh, and we're also going to be talking to that uh, about that with Jean Bajalan, who was... Uh, 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 in the area, in the region, um, in Kurdistan, I believe, uh, during 2004, 2005, also was taught uh, in the area. Um, and how, and also looking back on Hitchens' selling of the war uh, and why the sort of Kurdish sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of angle of that, like we got to help the Kurds, like the sort of limitations and the, I guess the final uh, referendum on how did that work out. Um, so check that out, patreon.com, so it's left reckoning. Um, hey guys. Hey. Hey. Hello. Hello. Uh, what's happening on the discourse, Brandon? Well, we'll have a new episode for you out early this weekend or, or sorry, early next week or this weekend. Uh, I'm a little busy with some personal matters, but we are desperate to talk about the crackdown on crypto. Crypto. And possibly the arrest of our former president, Donald Ooh. J. Trump. I mean, is that even happening? Do we even know if he's getting arrested? No well, I mean, it said that Bragg says it's likely, but it's just hilarious that. And he, Trump has seemed afraid, but he also raised a lot of money in the past mm -hmm. week. <laughs> yeah, the the blurred lines between legal defense fund and uh, fundraising operation are really benefiting. It's him a win win. So yeah. The grand jury was supposed to meet yesterday, but they didn't, and they're meeting today. But they might have another witness, so like. No, they were also supposed to meet today, and that's not happening now either. Oh, they're not doing it either today. So when when did um um, I don't know where Trump got Tuesday from. I don't know either. Maybe he just. He I went, don't know either. Oh, oh we lost yeah, Brandon. We lost Brandon. Um, uh, Al, 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 the Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg sent out a, a letter to uh, Republicans in Congress today, basically saying, "Why did you like you're you're asking information based on." Donald Trump believing he was going to be arrested, uh, indicted on Tuesday. We this never no, no information has come from our office whatsoever hmm. about this. Mm. So there's nothing to provide you with. Sounds like a humble brag. <laughs> uh, 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 what's happening um, on uh, on doomed and scam economy? Sure. So on doomed last night, uh, Lance from the Surfs joined me to discuss. Uh, exactly that the uh, the arrest of Donald J Trump. Uh, really, what we spoke about more broadly was what actually is um, you know is, is did he do, um, and of course uh, you know how this country uh, views the very worst thing you can possibly do, uh, and that's uh, breaking campaign finance laws. Uh, nothing's worse than that, apparently. Um, we also discussed basically how. Um, uh, the right was reacting, how his supporters were reacting, and then we got into a broader discussion about uh, AI based on those AI photos of uh, Trump being arrested that was actually, like, tricking people into believing that, like, they were real. Like, people saw AI photos, uh, like, you know, photos made with AI. Of him running Donald from Trump. the cops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. and Best use of AI were, so far. People were legitimately like, obviously not people involved in politics, but like, you know, just people browsing through and like who follow their favorite like 
yeah. Twitter sports pages and stuff. They were seeing this and they were they thought it was legit. I saw um, some libertarian be like, uh, how can people like protest police brutality and then celebrate this? Oh this my truck, god. Running away from <laughs> cops with billy clubs. <laughs> Yeah, he's missing a hand in one of them. So it's just like, let's not go crazy about the dangers of this kind of stuff. It's, right. In one, right. in one of them, the AI uh, obviously misunderstood the uh, the prompt, and one of them gave Trump a billy club as well. <laughs> <laughs> he, he took it. He took it from yeah. the cop. Right. I mean, right. escape uh, escape opportunity. Right. And then uh, on Scam Economy, which will uh, be released on... Oh, so you can check that out at youtube.com slash Matt And it'll be up today at doomthecast.com. And then Sunday, the latest episode of Scam Economy will drop. And I spoke with uh, Jackie Sawicki. She's the founder of Concerned Citizens of Navarro County and a member of the National Coalition Against Crypto Mining to discuss uh, what happened to her uh, small rural Texas town when one of the biggest Bitcoin mining companies moved in. Uh, mm. It's a very interesting discussion. Uh, definitely check that out. It's been happening to uh, communities really all across the, the country. These Bitcoin mining companies come in uh, and they uh, convince local politicians to give them these sweetheart deals. And they end up making more off of uh, those government deals than they do actually mining uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so definitely check that out. That'll go up at youtube.com slash Matt Binder and at scameconomy.com. All right. The number is 646-257-3920. We'll be taking your calls. I am still broken. I'm sorry, guys. We're trying to get it fixed on our end, uh, but we'll take your calls for sure. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. Can you bring back DJ Dennis? Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Dennis. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, Snowflake says what? 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 A hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, hell, hell, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. My birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. Black. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total.
and back. We are back on the majority report. The number is 646-257-3920. I am turning off the voicemail uh, again. No IMs right now, unfortunately. Uh, I believe, sad. are we not going out on the app either? Is there a problem with the app? Maybe? Sorry, folks. There's something down with the server. Oh, it's, damn. There are problems all over the place today. It's crazy. Well, I'm not, I'm not seeing looking. calls, and that's a problem, too. Oh, oh well, that's probably, it's all related. It's all in the same system. The matrix Can has finally come for us. No, okay. Oh, wait, oh, no, I the voicemail's coming now, I turn off the, now we get calls. We get calls. All right, calls. Okay. Calls are working, and with that, we'll take a call right off.